Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is the level two recording for March 15th, and the topic today is all about higher faculties. What is the um, what is the pineal gland? How does this relate to Christ consciousness? And in level two, we're going to talk more about cosmic identity, the sense of res personal responsibility and cosmic identity. So now let me go back to this image. I showed it briefly in level one, and now we're going to look at it a little bit um, more in depth. And my little pen, I should have charged it up more, my little stylus pen, and been a little bit more prepared for class. So it's, um, its batteries aren't that strong. So I'm just going to uh, show this and, and uh, talk to you about it. So what you see here, is a roughly poetic description and poetic interpretation of what is happening at this level of the Christ chakra or eye of insight or brow energy center or indigo energy center. Those are all synonymous, even though some of them have religious connotations. But it's this idea that it's a very special and important area on your anatomy. Uh, just like your, I was saying before in level one, like your heart and lungs, these are special organs. Like you can live without your spleen, you can live without part of your liver, you can live without part of your kidneys, you can't live without your heart, you can't live without your lungs. These are vital, vital organs. So in humanity, this eye of insight and this connection to the divine, which is what the, um, the, the violet crown is all about, the crown chakra is all about, these are vital aspects of anatomy. Like other aspects of anatomy are, are important too, like your emotion, your mammalian emotions are important and your human intellect are important. But the truth is, if you totally close down your violet chakra, you would not have enough vitality to keep your cellular metabolism going. You would die because you don't have enough energy to make your overarching system go. So these are really, really important aspects of consciousness. And in terms of... Um, um, navigating the time field and the time field, I'll put down this little sculpture and pick up this little sculpture and hold it super close to the camera. This is representative of the time field. So we have these chakras or energy centers that are our individual time centers and they fit together within a larger matrix of shapes that are like this, like what you see over my shoulder in all these paintings, that is the time field. And that the eye of insight and the connection to higher dimensional, less dense realms, that these are like the steering wheel that we use to navigate the time field. Or as I said in level one, it's like getting your library card and then connecting to the librarian. If where, 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 dependent upon where you think is what road of time you will go down, you will experience. Let me see if I can draw my finger on this. Let me see if it'll let me do it. Oh, good. Like, let's say that that is a road of time that is moving forward from, you know, the center of your forehead. And you are able to travel on that road of time because you have focused on it with your awareness. And your awareness is like the needle on a record. Like, here's an old-fashioned analog record. And here's the song of your life. It's a groovy groove that spirals all the way into the center. And then we'll make a different color this red dot is the needle of awareness and it plays the song of your life going through all of these little recorded areas of information until it gets to the inevitable you know final um, um uh metamorphosis out of this level of reality oh thank you very much brandon is appreciating this drawing so yeah people sometimes wonder they're like does aurora have drawing skills can she paint a thing that looks like a thing like i can draw a face i can paint a thing that looks like a thing and i also you know uh, focus on these abstract um, mathematical perfections but yeah, this is um, anthropomorphic um, seeing. So the difference between anthropomorphic and abstract seeing, this is seeing through my human filter. And seeing through my human filter is um, susceptible to distortion. That's why I tend in my paintings now to focus on abstraction, which is empirical. It is, um, it is without distortion. I know that the information that I'm sharing here in these abstractions over my shoulder is absolutely accurate. And I actually do them like I do a dissertation. Like I say, like, okay, I'm going to put this color here, but someone at some point is going to walk up and with the magnifying glass, they're going to say, why is this part dark blue and this part is light blue? And I'm going to have to defend my dissertation and say, well, it's that because of that. And these um, anthropomorphic drawings are more poetic. They are more interpretations through my human filter about what I see. And what, so what you're seeing here, we have, you know, these basic wheels of energy that are like chakras, and you can see how where they all are converging on that central point. And that central point is also the place where you are, I'll drop from above, you've got this lovely crown chakra that is like a vortex that comes down from the top, right? And that's like your librarian. And the whole point of me showing you this drawing here today is that you can see 
here's the guy's little feet and his head are right here and they're pointing into there. And here's another guy's got little feet and his head is pointing into there. This is a cluster of other beings that are all telepathically connected to the primary being, the person with this face down here. So this all has to do now with identity and sense of self and who is talking through you. On, on level one, I was talking about um, genetic invaders. And you know, usually I save that information to le lesson 18, but we're like, we're like out of the frying pan into the fire. Like we're here, we're not, I'm not pulling any punches. And I love it when people in the comments section, they say like, Aurora, we can take it. Cause I used to, you know, like um, make sure that it was only for the initiated people that were ready for it. But everyone's like, no, we want to hear it the full, uh, don't, don't, don't pull anything back. So I'm like, that's fantastic because I don't want anybody to claw out their eyes because they're saying that they've got demons inside of them. And I don't want anybody to pick up a gun and shoot other people because they see that there's demons inside of other people. But the truth is there's demons inside of you and there's demons inside of other people. And those demons live in the genetic code. I'll go back to my face because our planet has been invaded, our genetic code has been degraded, and where those invaders live is they live inside of each one of us. But there's actually good news associated with that um, realization because you are the king or queen of your personal country. Like this is Aurora Land, and I'm the queen of Aurora Land, and I get to make the rules about who comes inside and what goes on inside of my personal country. And same thing with Cheeky. For uh, we'll show Cheeky because I don't know if anybody on lesson two has seen this. Oh, uh, someone's asking what do demons look like? This is Cheeky down here. Cheeky is her own particular country too, and this is important because even though she might be a domesticated dog, that doesn't mean that she has any less uh, self volition than um, I do or you do as a human. That each one of us is supposed to say, I, this is my body and I get to say uh, who comes inside of it and what thoughts come inside of it. Ideally, what is supposed to happen is each one of us gets to choose like a waiter with a platter, like at a beautiful fancy party, is walking around with hors d'oeuvres and saying, do you want some of this? Do you want some of this? Do you want some of this? And that you get to say, no, I don't want any of that. No, that looks gross. No, that looks terrible. No, take it all away. And that that's your personal choice. So we're supposed to be given opportunities. Like these are different thoughts you can think. Which thoughts do you want to think? As opposed to having intrusive thoughts placed inside of our mind without our specific invitation or intention. And that's what mostly humans are experiencing because the hacked human operating system, that yellow level of, of um, perception and organization of the human daily intellect is hacked. And by that, I mean, it is an intentionally insecure program. It's not secure. Like my, uh, my, my tablet here has security measures. I have to put my thumb on a little sensor that says, oh, that's Aurora. Aurora is allowed to open up this apparatus and do stuff inside of it. But it would be a hack on the system if it was like, oh, anybody from Apple computers could just type remotely and see what I'm saying with my computer. That's not supposed to happen. So the whole idea is your body is like your computer. I'm not a transhumanist, you're much more than a computer, but it is like a computer that should be totally encrypted and only for you to access. And that you shouldn't have to worry about your ancestors or your mommy or your daddy or human society or President Trump or the Pope or anybody else other than you accessing your genetic code, even though we understand that that has been the unintentional you know, uh, state of affairs for a very long amount of time. People actually carry family demons. So, and the one, uh, what, someone asked what demons look like, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. But demons are consciousness presences. They're like the undigested fatty deposits lining the arteries of the greater time body. So again, if you eat a lot of food and you don't um, focus on that food while you're eating it and you don't, um, don't transmute it into you know, a higher dimensional non-physical substance, it gets stuck on your body. And it might get stuck as like adipose tissue, like you know, um, fat that is on your, your skeleton, and it might get stuck at, on your organs in terms of fat in, inside of your organs and inside of your circulatory system. They're undigested experiences. So let's say there is a trauma, an emotional perturbation that exists in the field of consciousness, and it's not um, transmuted, it's not digested. What happens is it becomes like a blockage, a solidification, and that's what I'm always drawing. My pen needs to charge up, but that's what I'm always drawing with my little time 
vortex, I'll use my finger because I didn't charge up my thing properly today for today's class. There we go, my finger works just fine. Those pesky occupiers of the interstices. So I just drew the time vortex and here's the infinity timeline. And now we'll draw some of these pink dots that these are all blockages in what is supposed to be like the clear arteries. Look, this is supposed to be like a beautiful clear artery that has energy that flows through it. And uh, instead what we have are these consciousness blockages. They are literally undigested trauma, traumatic experiences, emotional residue of the overarching being that we live within. So we live within this overarching being. And just in the same way that we have white light, I'll go back to this, oops, go back to this, go back to the whiteboard. White light. So let's say that this, I know it's not white, but let's say this circle that I'm drawing in black, that's white light. And white light from our sun, at technically it's yellow green, you know, from Sol, from our local um, star broadcaster. But the idea is that the light that comes from the sun and the stars is like the culmination of the recipe. That's like the cake. And that it gets split up into its constituent elements, the recipe that makes the cake. Here's the red, maybe that's like the flower. There's no orange in my palette, so we'll just make it pink. Here's the sugar, here's the eggs, that comes from there. Here's the vanilla extract. Here's, let's make another color. Here's like blueberries that go into the batter. And here's, um, you know, uh, whatever, some other delicious flavoring that goes into the batter. And then, you know, a little tiny dash of salt goes into there too. And those are all the things that make the cake taste delicious. And if you took away any of those elements, we wouldn't end up with cake. We would have something like, you know, flat and gross that didn't come together or didn't have that cohesion or that all of the ingredients coming together in order to make the um, final thing what is supposed to be. The final thing is a sense of self. It's a character. It's a being. So this is also big because, and I'm going to talk to what all these questions are, really good questions there. The question of the sense of self we're in a being, just like I have red blood cells that circulate through my body and are part of my health and vitality, and they have their own individual agenda. My red blood cells are like, got to get to the heart. And then they're like, now we got to get to the organs. And then they're like, now we got to get to the heart. Like they've got their agenda. They've got their whole life. And they're also part of me while I'm running around with my dog or playing the piano. Like they're part of my life. We have our own personal agenda gotta get to the store and buy some chicken, you know, gotta whatever, buy some dog food, gotta go home and put on my pajamas and go to sleep. And those personal agendas are flowing within the larger time field. And that time field has characteristics. It's a person, it's a persona that has different flavors of characteristics. And some of those characteristics, well, in, so now, now I'll clarify. This is lesson eight of level two. So on level, level two, lesson eight, if you listen to the recorded lessons, P.S., I, I invite and encourage everyone to enroll and take the recorded lessons. Um, uh, I speak in idealized terms, and I recorded those lessons about four years ago. And I was talking about um, the personality characteristics of the cosmos and how everything is a necessary characteristic, just like in level one of this recording, I just spoke about all of the different instruments of the great symphony and how it's essential to have both the very high piccolos and the very deep bass and they all fit together to make this beautiful music, collaborative music of life. In an ideal world, that's what our planetary natural life would be. Like we've got you know, blue whales and we've got crocodiles and we've got flamingos and we've got all these other organisms that are you know, strange and exotic and that they all are supposed to be there and that they're all supposed to have their own um, place in the ecosystem and in the natural order of the world. And so, so too is it with personality characteristics. Like think about certain personality characteristics, like those of a crocodile. Like, you know, we wouldn't necessarily say, I wanna be friends with a crocodile, but we say it's part of the ecosystem, it has its place. But we're in a distorted time field where there are some things that are over-exaggerated and some things that are under-abundant. So what if we said, oh yes, so the, uh, the assertion in, in lesson eight is that crocodiles and their characteristics are natural and they're part of the world. It's almost like an indigenous or Native American understanding that all these organisms exhibit a certain characteristic that is like a fractal um, or um, um, what's the word, diffraction, like we have diffracted uh, using a, a prism, not a prison with an N, 
prism, like the triangular structure that emits um, white light into rainbow light, that if we were to take away any of those rays of consciousness, the overarching recipe would fail. So crocodiles are part of the overarching recipe. But how many crocodiles and under what circumstances and what are they supposed to actually be doing? So now let me redraw this time vortex and I'll get to all the wonderful questions and comments. Okay, this time vortex over here. Like, let's say these are the membranes of death. And I know that I draw these in a very exaggerated way. And here's the central core timeline that you want to be on. And now let's say that these pink timelines are all the timelines that end in death. And I'm on this pink timeline. I'm going in this direction. I'm not at the membrane of death yet. And now I'll draw like a big green. This is like a fear. I just arbitrarily chose that color over there. It's a fear. And it can be embodied as like, envisioned rather, as like a monster or like, you know, something with teeth or something like that. Something that stands in front of you, in front of your path. I'm going to get attacked with kisses over here. And someone's going to eat my strawberry lipstick. <laughs> Thank you, boss. You're a very good boss. I have the best boss. She makes me work very hard. Uh, so that fear that exists there, it's supposed to be something that diverts you from the membrane of death. It's supposed to be like saying, yellow caution flags, don't come over here. Giant toothy monster, don't come over here. Like go in a different direction. It's supposed to redirect you. However, what we are finding that, so that would be in an idealized time world. And I'll get to that comment that's not distorted with everything functioning the way it's supposed to be. Kind of like a computer program, even though I'm not a transhumanist, but a cosmic computer program where all of these organisms and characteristics and tendencies play their role and play their part. So this is how everyone can understand, like, why is fear here? Why does fear exist? Why was fear invented? Why did the great conductor and composer make fear happen? And the answer is fear is supposed to be like the yellow caution flag, like you're about to go over a cliff, Red, red, red alert, red alert, don't do this, don't do this. And instead, so what I just drew is perfect, now I'm gonna erase it, but what, I, what happens instead is fear goes over here. Fear goes over here, fear goes over here. Fear goes wherever the, the freaking hell it wants to go. And here you are going on a perfectly fine, all of these are perfectly fine trajectories, but fear has decided to reprogram itself so that instead of being just Fear is supposed to be just here, like right before you hit the membrane of death. You're supposed to be like, no, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. So here's like an, an example would be, let's say, um, you know, you're, you're not supposed to get in an airplane with a parachute and jump out of it on your birthday because you're actually going to die if you do that. So you're like getting on your parachute, putting on your equipment, putting on your helmet, getting ready to go on the plane, and all of a sudden you feel fear. It's like, I'm afraid I shouldn't go because I'm going to die. That would be in a perfect world. But what actually happens is that you might be on a perfectly fine timeline where you're going to successfully jump out and your parachute will work perfectly and you'll land gently and then go off and drink some champagne. But you feel that fear anyway. So what we have is instead of the fear notes of the music of the cosmos being played at exactly the right time, like, dun, dun, don't do that, something bad's gonna happen. Instead, we feel it all the time. And that's what people experience fear and anxiety all the time. People experience social fear and social anxiety when they're doing simple, something simple rather like going to a coffee shop. Nothing bad is gonna happen when you go to the coffee shop, but there's a giant toothy monster standing in front of you saying, don't go to the coffee shop. And it's like, you're supposed to go to the coffee shop. Maybe there's even the love of your life is at the coffee shop and that that fear has decided to reprogram itself. So now we're getting into this whole idea of the distorted time field. So in the recorded lesson, I'm talking about the idealized world with everything functioning exactly on target the way it's supposed to. But we recognize that that original program has been subverted and has been distorted so that now there is sometimes an overabundance of certain negative personality characteristics and that they're often out of place not in the realm or ecosystem where they're supposed to be. Like, what would it be like if you had all crocodiles? What would it be like if you had like crocodiles on your front lawn, crocodiles at the supermarket, crocodiles in the street, crocodiles everywhere? Like, they're not supposed to be there. You're supposed to have a certain number of crocodiles in certain places, and they're supposed to whatever, eat their flamingos and then, you know, be happy crocodiles. You're not supposed to have them everywhere. So there's an overabundance of fear, these fear beings. All right, let me go. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you too, Joy, because I see that there's good stuff going on here in the chat. I don't just want to steamroller along, but sometimes I'm, I'm in, in the zone. So let me, so one of the first questions Joel was asking, what do demons look like? Okay, so sometimes demons can actually look like toothy monsters. When I perceive them though, I don't even necessarily see something that has a face. 
but I sometimes hear them as you know these um, intrusive thoughts, like they're mostly experienced by me as verbalized thoughts. Not all verbalized thoughts are demonic, but I'm now able to determine like, oh, like that thing that I just heard, first of all, it doesn't arise from within me. And second of all, it's definitely unloving. And that these are, because the demons, they are disembodied. That's the whole point. And that's, this is also how we can understand, like if some supposed ascended master, Jesus or whomever comes to you telepathically and is like, I want to live through your body. I want to eat through you. I want to talk through you. I want to gesture through you. You have to be like, hmm, where's your body? What happened to your body? Why do you want my body? Because if you ascend, like if, you're, uh, if you graduate, you don't have no body. You have a higher dimensional body. You don't need somebody's old flesh body. So you have to wonder like, hmm, why do you want my flesh body? And the answer is because those are the musicians that got kicked out of the band. They had bodies at one point, they died horribly intentionally, and now they occupy the interstices like unresolved cosmic trauma. And they're not actually personality characteristics that are supposed to be there. And as I said in level one, so many people in this time and place are identifying as their true self with the personality characteristics that are not supposed to be there. And some of them are ancestral. Some of them are ancestral and they are involved in like um, many, many generations. It can be the sense of being oppressed, like ancestral guilt. Like this, uh, a lot of people have that. Oh, my people have been killed for this many generations. I carry around that pain inside of me. And it's like, yes, almost every um, ethnicity has experienced genocide. Black people, white people, Armenian people, Jewish people, like everywhere, like there's penguin genocide. Like everybody's got that heavy burden that they carry with them but it's not appropriate because that happened many generations ago. And you in this generation do not have to experience genocide. So carrying around their undigested, unresolved trauma in your genetic code is not appropriate. So to me, demons don't actually have faces. They are not embodied people. And this is also, I can clarify, when I talk about demons and satanic technology and dark magic being deployed on the surface of earth right now, I don't mean to say that there's like a literal demonic being that has, you know, horns like a devil man that, you know, is, is um, possessing like President Obama or something like that. Like, that's not what I mean. But what I do mean is that there is an abstract thought form that is the undigested trauma and emotional pain of the cosmos that is floating around looking for a body to live through and it finds a human host to live through which to live. And a lot of these human hosts have a particular genetic uh, dance. That that's the whole idea. When you do the flying rainbow on your dance, you make yourself uh, not palatable to them. They can't eat you. You make yourself um, a home that has secure windows and doors that they can't get into. It's like you kick the demons out of your own code and they don't get to live in you anymore. And that's profound. Imagine what would happen if everybody did that with their own body. Because you're really only in charge of your own body. So it, again, it's not appropriate for me to wave my magic wand and poof, all of you kick out the demons from your own body. Like see, it might seem an expediency, like, oh, like I've just dusted off my hands. There we go, have a lot of fun, everything is great. But no, it's actually not appropriate because it's like saying, if I do the exercise, I gain the muscles. If you want the muscles, you have to do the exercise. That's what this is all about. It is all a personal endeavor towards freedom. And I'm not just being coy, like, well, no, just wave your magic wand, we'll all be free, because that wouldn't be a real freedom. It wouldn't be like lasting. It's kind of like a Band-Aid. It's kind of like, oh, like someone else made me free, and now I'll just go right back into slavery. Like, when you make yourself free, like, there's no regression. You don't regress. You don't gain all the weight back after you've been, you know, fit and healthy for a long time. You keep the good eating and exercising habits going because you made them for yourself. So now about all of these comments, let me get back to all of these comments. Oh, someone's talking. Someone's talking. I know. I know. Oh, I know that's too loud though. All right. Um, yeah. Beth Major is agreeing with me. She, but one person is saying they've seen blobs, spiders, snakes. It's like coming through your anthropomorphic filter. I'm not saying that's not true, but it's saying this. there's something there, but that you're interpreting it through your earthly human filter. Um, Beth is saying they're not physical, so it's sketchy. That's exactly right. They're not physical. They don't have bodies. And uh, Infinity Cell is agreeing. He says, yes, so the seeing may be unique to our own lens. 
Yes, yes, yes. Depending upon your cultural filter, a person would interpret demons in different ways. So some people would see them as, oh, a red faced scaly being with horns. Some people would see them as a snake and some people would see them as a toothy monster or maybe a, a shaggy monster, like, you know, like a big giant hairy type of thing. Um, so Joel is asking, what I mean is demon is an overused word. Like are the genetic invaders the same as demons in possessions or hauntings? I know demon is a very highly emotionally charged word, which is why I tend not to use it. And I use lighthearted terms like pesky occupiers of the interstices because I don't want anyone to be unduly um, feared or impressed by these beings. They're the turds who refuse to flush. So, um, wait, wait, wait. More, more questions, wait. Um, Yes, possessions. Let's talk about possessions. That's exactly what I'm talking about. The idea of um, tuning one's genetic um, antenna to pick up a station, like a broadcast, that is one of these malevolent consciousnesses. That some people do that. And there are some substances that, let me just drink some water to get really thirsty. There are some substances that make people way more likely to tune in to these malevolent broadcasters methamphetamine and some other pharmaceutical drugs that make people um, tune their antenna to the most malevolent broadcasters. And I had to learn about that too, like because I've, I've been relatively naive and innocent. And so I had to learn like, oh, like you can't even talk to that guy over there because that guy's taking meth or is on meth. And that means that he is just literally a conduit for a demon. And I've, whatever, it's just, for some people is like, it is a, a literal chemical that they have ingested. P.S. Where do you think chemicals come from? All these chemical companies were all created by demons who influenced, you know, beings that had living bodies. I said, I'll make you rich, like make a bunch of this carcinogen, make a bunch of this chemical contaminant, put a bunch of fluoride in the water, I'll pay you. Like that is literally the demonic agreement that many embodied humans make. Again, they're identifying with or associating with as self the pathogenic personality characteristics that aren't part of the overarching meta persona. More questions. Eric says, our demons got things to say. That's okay. That's okay. Take it reverse. Maybe we'll find the truth. Our demons got things to do. That's okay. That's okay. Just take it reverse. Maybe they'll work for you. Judah and the lion conversations. Interesting. Must be a song lyric. Very interesting. Infinity Cell says, the genetic code aberration is the physical vibratory complex that leads to the corresponding consciousness vibratory structure where the entropic semi-conscious entity known as demons live and play very astute that is very very good so there's an actual hell realm or a membrane or an interstice between levels of reality and this can also be considered the astral or the lower astral meaning the world of mind the world of projected mind but this is not the world of projected mind of perfected individuals that what's supposed to happen is you lose your physical body and you project your perfected body your beautiful light body and that's what's eternal and instead these of turds who refuse to flush, they are simply maintaining their pain through time and refusing to have it be mollified or healed or washed away in any way. And that is how they are continuing their um, continuation, continuing their consciousness traveling through time. So Joel asks, the blockages in the greater beings Taurus is reflecting in our toroidal fields. Yes, 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 yes. Our individual bodies and our individual health and our individual challenges that we're facing are absolutely tiny, fractal, microcosmic versions of what is happening on a larger scale. Your personal struggles against addiction, it's totally not by accident that people say addiction is struggling with personal demons or suicide is struggling with personal demons. That's not by accident. You literally have two or multiple aspects of self that are fighting for control of the overarching physical persona. And that's happening on our planet right now. Multiple different forms of consciousness from various different origins are in the same body, on the same planet, fighting for supremacy. It's also happening in our galaxy. Not to make anybody think that this is a hopeless situation because flying rainbow lasagna. And this healing happens first on an individual cellular level. You're like one cell in a body. Just take care of you. Just take care of you and set yourself free and take care of your own mind and your own trajectory. And the more of us that do that, the more that there is no longer a fertile breeding ground for demonic consciousness to occupy. So one of the things, I, so my, this biological body is connected to ancestors who are Jewish. And when I came into this body, I came into all of the programming of guilt and the, you know, um, whatever, ethnic um, insults 
and um, you know what I'm trying to say, the, the uh, genocides that have done, been done against that particular group of humans. And I had to do the healing and say like, yes, yes, you experienced pain, you carried that pain, but I don't have to carry that pain forward for you and definitely not into future generations. Gonna sneeze. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I definitely need to drink some water or something like that too. Okay. Hold on a second. Sorry that I'm doing this while I'm busy talking on camera, guys. Sorry. Thank you for bearing with me. Just getting a little bit more. Something to drink. And then we'll be good. Okay. Okay. So, wait, 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 wait. And Beth is saying that this is mind blowing. I love to hear that and say and seeing all these connections. That's very beautiful. That's that's what this is all about. Like sharing these ideas and seeing all of this um, many different people grow. Um, Joelle is saying, Aurora, I'm so glad you came to this world and you did. Thanks for helping us remember and validate things you've always felt. I'm happy to do so. And this is also like sanity check because I'm not the only person thinking these things. Like many of us are thinking these things and that we are all on this soul migration together. That this is what, what is really happening in the most positive, wonderful way right now is that all of the intended personality characteristics are coming together and um, uplifting and supporting one another. So there's pathogenic personality characteristics that aren't supposed to be here. And if you think about it in terms of life, like I do not spend my time with people who are in addiction. I spend my time with people who are trying to eat and drink and do the best things they can for their body and to bring their physical self and their creativity in positive directions. That's intentional. I literally don't associate with people that have tuned their antenna to be conduits for demons or conduits for you know cosmic pain. That that's not who I associate with. And it's, it's been actually an education. Here's another very brief anecdote and I'll get some more of the questions. So this is back when I was living in Humboldt in Northern California and I went to buy this thing from a store. Like, you know, I wanted to shop local and support a local store. And the girl who was the retail worker, like at the, you know, like a little privately owned store or whatever, um, she had like a neck tattoo and like a lot of face piercings and whatever. But I was, I was like, oh, like that's, you know, that's just her look or whatever. And so she sold me the battery and the apparatus and I went home and the battery didn't work. I went back and I'm like, yeah, like you sold me this thing and it doesn't work and I'd like to return it. And they had just then put up a sign that said like, no returns, all sales final, blah, blah, blah. And she was like horrible towards me. And then she's like, I'm going to, she threatened to call the police. And I just had to stop and recognize like this person is an embodiment of a demon. They're just doing nothing but channeling constantly pain that the neck tattoos and the face piercings are not just mere um like um like accessories or it's not just a look that it's actually about what they are expressing as a person who lives inside of them and who they identify with and that they were very happy to hate and reject me because i'm like not in that zone I'm in the zone of joy and health and positivity and moving towards something better. And they're in the zone of entropy, losing energy, devolving, going towards death and um, de being degraded as opposed to life and being uplifted. And that the people that are on that trajectory, they hate the people that are joyful and they hate the people that are healthy and they hate the people that are creative and going in a positive direction. I literally had to learn that. I'm like, oh, that, that person hates me literally hates me and I haven't done anything to them. It's because of who I am and that I'm different from them and that I'm going in a different direction. That's just a little anecdote from living here on earth. Okay, wait, more good comments here. Um, thank you very much. That's a beautiful, this is what Joy was saying. Awesome, Joel, and thank you. And we love and appreciate you so much, Aurora. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Joel says, it makes sense that demons shift to a form that is scary or grotesque to get the fear response or wobble someone off the central timeline, but they are formless. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. So like in dreams or in visions or something like that, they will put on a scary monster face. And it's definitely a way of trying to intimidate you and also trying to make you feel disempowered, like going into that fear response, um, you know, like the idea of a herd animal, you know, like a, a horse or something like that, like gets afraid and then needs to run away, um, that they, they condescend to humans a lot. And they think like, oh, I can poke you with a stick and you'll go in this direction. Then I poke you with a stick over here, you go in this direction. And they're totally not prepared for either 
being your, a response where you are either not afraid of them, not intimidated by them, not impressed by them, and when you actually have effective tools to protect yourself, effective tools to protect yourself include the Merkaba. A lot of people say to me like, ah, the Merkaba is, is co-opted and it doesn't work anymore. No, 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 that's not true. Your Merkaba is like your um, immune system against pathogens. And it absolutely is effective. So I keep on saying this every, every, I've got this wonderful animation that I've been working on for a long time. I just need to finalize it. And I've been wanting to make some wonderful soundtrack for it too, which is why I don't have it prepared. But I want to do a whole teaching all about the Merkaba as individual cosmic immune system, as manifestation, um, you know, interface, and also as interdimensional vehicle for interdimensional travel. So that's what it is. But the basic is that it's a star tetrahedron. Let me show you a picture of it very quickly that one of the things you can do to protect yourself from demons or occupiers of the interstices is to imagine yourself sitting within a star tetrahedron like this, and that this, um, for me, I'm a female, this rotates around to the left, and this one at the bottom rotates around to the right, these two counter-rotating fields, and I do it until I feel this wonderful column of light coming down the center of my being that connects me to the sun up here, and I can't get my pen to go all the way to the bottom, but the earth all the way at the bottom, and that that is like your interdimensional um, immune system protecting you from pathogens. So they're, and they're not, they're also not prepared, those pathogens are not prepared for you to like laugh at them, to you know, be lighthearted. That's why I call them the turds who refuse to flush. Like I don't call them the horrible, toothy, scary monsters. I call them turds. That's what they are. They're turds. Don't be unduly impressed. Um, okay, let me go back to the rest of the questions and make sure that I get through everything. Okay. Rachel says, I have seen them referring to the demons in form, and perhaps they are a test to a level of awareness. And I had no fear. I was not scared, just observing. Those are less scary than the entities that control the people around you. Definitely. And you know something? When you're energetically perceptive and when you start to open up your inner eye, again, this is part of the caveat, once you are fill, you're filling up your container of light, filling up, filling up, fills up to this level, and you start to look around, and you're like, wow, that guy's got a literal demon in him. Like you can see that and that's truthful. And I had to learn more funny finished fish out of water anecdotes. When I first came here as Aurora, I spoke very openly. I'm like, oh yeah, like, yeah, I had brain injury because I was attacked by a bunch of demons. And like, oh yeah, that guy over there is a demon. And people, I spoke about demons so openly that people thought that I was either insane or schizophrenic or that I had some profound, you know, mental problem. I had to learn like, oh, it's, I can't speak about them that openly or I cannot use that vocabulary word. So for many, many years, I talked about negative occupiers of the interstices or negative personality characteristics. I used very cautious language because also I understood that in order to break through the social filters that it was necessary to speak differently. But now, like, really, there are so many people that are awake and that are aware about this. I don't have to be as cautious about the exact words that I use. But also, you know, demon is a very biblical term, a very religious term emotionally loaded term and what they they're like consciousness residues but they're quite malevolent they are very ill-intentioned so but they're not all powerful at all even though many of them control powerful people on our planet right now so many many world leaders and religious leaders and economic powerhouses are infested with demonic presences or malevolent non-physical beings in fact that's one way that you get to be powerful in this inverted society in which we find ourselves if you want to be powerful and have a bunch of money like work for demons, literally. You're like, hey, I've got a physical body. I've got real estate. Come live inside of my body and I'll be happy to let you do it. And then you can give me a big fat paycheck. We've got lots of movie stars that do this. We've got lots of pop stars that do this. These are not role models. These are not people that you should model yourself after at all. And I steer clear of that entire world. I try not to ingest their creative output. I try not to listen to their crap music. I don't watch their crap movies. And when I do watch movies and television, all I can think now when I look at them, I'm like, hey, did they just change, did they change their face? Did they get some kind of artificial augmentation of their face? What type of deal did they make with some type of, you know, demonic presence in order to have this um, experience and in order to have the, you know, physical wealth that they have? That's all I can think. It's not entertainment at all. It's like watching um, something decompose. It's not entertaining to me. All right. This is an interesting comment. Okay, this is good. Eric says, Eric says, demon can be considered short for interdimensional being as not all dimensional beings are malevolent. I think that's a good point to say. There are many non-embodied, not interdimensional beings that are not, not only not malevolent, but that are highly benevolent. 
and I'm one of them. And that's why I had to create the flying rainbow lasagna to get into a body. Um, you know, it's kind of like bending the rules a little bit. Um, this is what I wanted to read. Brandon says, it's snowing here. Brandon's in Alaska. Oh, is it okay if I read this because it said privately? Um, imagined the sun in every flake, then imagined FRLs in every flake falling from the sky and covering the ground in zillions, following the steady flow to a sky of endless sunlight, led to thoughts of infinity. Now imagine the earth inside of a giant FRL. Share if you feel relevant. Brandon, that is beautiful. I love that visualization. And that's really perfect because all of the, like you're doing FRL with all of these water crystals that are in your immediate environment. All of the water on the planet is connected. When you FRL with all of those crystals, all of, you know, the solidified water crystals, you're also FRLing with all of the water that is liquid, that's flowing in other places, that is um, it, transpiring you know, in, in the plants, in the air, in the atmosphere, that's in clouds, that's in the actual oceans, and that's in the cellular structure of other people. That, that is one of the most profound and effective ways to connect your consciousness to the rest of everything. Here's a good question. Someone asked me in Facebook, and then they asked me in comments about the ethics of FRLing with other people. Do you need specific consent? And that's a really, really good question because I've spoken about how telepathy should be done only on a bridge of love. That means it should be consensual. But like if I want to be telepathic with the tree outside of my window, do I have to go to it and say like, will you please sign this consent form that you would like to connect with me? No, what I do is I'm, I'm like, knock, knock, knock. You want to talk? Not a good time? Okay, another time. Like that's, that's the type of, it's like an invitation. Like I would like to connect with you. Would you like to connect? Okay, if not, I'll just dance away to someone else. So the basic answer, it's a two-part answer. Just if you're like a guitar, I'm strumming my guitar of my jeans, I'm playing my awesome rock and roll music, and my music is just simply emanating outward and affecting everyone around me. All the microbes, all the water molecules, the entire planet, all the life that's here, all the dogs that are sitting on my lap, it's just affecting everyone. And that's totally ethical. And that's been pretty much my life as a Laura. But, and also, I specifically connect with the people that are in this class. I telepathically reach out to everyone, like I connect with people in this class and people who I speak with online and people that I know in, in per, face to face, in person. And those are people that I already have developed a rapport with. So I know that it's okay for me to specifically um, interact with their, with their mind, with their perception, with their DNA. And then I do it respectfully, just like if I was in a band. Like if someone else is playing the piano, I don't try to put my fingers on their keyboard. I'm like, cool, you are playing the piano. I'm playing this instrument over here. So it's more about integrating. I'm like, oh wait, you're playing that beat over there. That's awesome. I'm gonna start playing this beat over here and that is how we integrate. So the, the two part answer is you do not require specific consent if you're just dancing your way through the world, which is a totally fine thing to do. It's like, I'm just being me, I'm just doing my thing. But, and if you are specifically interacting with other beings, because this person wanted to know about healing, who wanted to heal someone else, you actually do need another person's permission to heal them because they've developed their disease for particular reasons. I'm just drinking water here. Some guy's got a toenail fungus. It's because he chose to get the toenail fungus for whatever he needed to learn for his particular life. And if I just wave my magic wand and poof, the fungus disappeared, he might be missing out on some vital life learning lesson. So, you know, it's just like anything, like if I meet someone who has cancer and I say to them like, hey, like you might want to try using cannabis medicine in order to heal your cancer, but I can't force them to do it, but I can plant the seed of an idea, you know, in them if, if they're open to it. So all of this is, I say, you can do um, uh, uh, a specific, like an amendment when you send out energy to someone, when you send out healing energy to someone, you can say, I send this energy out with the intention of healing blah, blah person. I'm sending this out in love. And if they do not wish to accept it, then may this energy flow to where it can be of most service or flow to where it is in the best position because there might be someone else that you don't know about or that maybe is inarticulate, maybe a little baby in a womb somewhere that needs that healing energy. And if this guy with the toenail fungus isn't ready to be healed, that's fine. He can be as fungally infected as he wants to be, but maybe that guy over there who's still just dating in the womb could really use that energy and maybe the energy wants to flow to him. So it's totally appropriate to do that. And that even thinking in that sense shows that you're a good musician. You're a sensitive musician. You're thinking about uh, how I'm listening to the other organisms. I'm listening to how what I say and do, what I send out impacts them. That is having a good jam session, not just, you know, playing as loud as you possibly can and trying to, um, you know, over, over arch, any, overwrite or whatever anyone. 
All right. Rachel is saying this. This is really good about addiction. Addiction is such a gateway to interdimensional entities. We must be free. Nothing must control us. That's a really good point about addiction. And addiction can be white powdery substances or pharmaceutical substances. It can be food. I recognize that a lot of people in this time and place are addicted to things like sugar or fast food or carbohydrates or sweets or whatever, that there's a lot of, it's unhealthy use of a substance. People can also be addicted to media that I recognize people can be addicted to like their cell phone or social media or what people can be addicted to TV. I've seen a lot of people like that, like the drooling, I'm going down like this, like the drooling masses, they just have a giant, giant TV and they just sit there being hypnotized by it all the time, that addiction can take many different, um, many different um, forms in this time and place. And that, it, again, I couldn't wave my magic wand and take away other people's addiction because they literally need to run the marathon themselves. They need to be either like, you know something, that fast food is not good for my body. And I, even though I might think that I want it, I actually want to live a long, healthy, vital life. I don't actually want to eat it. Like that's their vital realization that they need to come up with. Just like the guy with the toenail fungus has to be ready for his healing. So a big part of addiction is people fighting their own demons, their own battles. And um, support for that person who would be fighting addiction would be like, um, you know, encouraging them towards positive actions or whatever and not putting up with like if they're in their in their addiction, they're busy drooling on the TV and, and eating too much fast food. Be like, I'm not hanging out with you. I'm not spending time with you. you. Like, if you're doing that, that's not something that I want to interact with or, or absorb. I don't interact with people. I'm so happy that I live in a household that does not have TV. So I don't have to listen to someone else, like listening to game shows or, you know, like the news or something like that. Like that's all crappy addiction behavior. And I don't have to listen to people that are, um, you know, engaging in that, that level of mentality. Okay. Yeah. Donna is agreeing on the idea of seeing our addictions as demons, even monkey on the back and some of the metaphors that we use is very, very cogent. Okay. Um, Tracy asks, why is it so hard to rid ourselves of them, the demons and the addictions? Why can't we just ask our higher selves to align us with our right path to infinity and to instantly shed any demons or energies that are not of our higher good? It's an excellent question. And the answer is, why is it so hard to get rid of fleas? Because fleas want to eat blood from you. They want to live on you as like their place to live. And if they don't eat your blood and live on you, they don't have a gig and they don't have a place to be. So these addiction demons and monsters they want to live in your genetic code and eat your energy because they don't have another place to be. They don't have their own body. They don't have their own natural habitat. They don't have their own connection to the source so they can get their energy and eat love that they want to eat off of you. So when you are kicking them out of your system, they're like, wait, wait, that's my job. That's my, my source of income. That's my home. What am I going to do? I'm going to be a homeless demon. So that's the whole idea. So Part of it is sending them to entropy. Like you make yourself unpalatable so they can't eat you, but also taking energy away from them, which is you could also think of it like erasing them in time or rewinding the tape to a time when they didn't exist, unmake them. So they're not just sitting around like hungry fleas looking for the next dog to jump on just so that they can eat the next person. Um, Patricia has, it was agreeing with my little anecdote. She says, it's like I'm despised for my light, but it's all good. I choose love. That's, it was just, it was a really interesting realization it's like when people look at my little dog and they see that she's cute and they're like that's such a cute dog i hate cute dogs it's like who would hate a cute dog but some people do so you just recognize that, that that's unconditional love is the acceptance that that's how some people act um thank you nicole nicole says you explain everything in such an easy to understand way thank you it's how i try to be it's why i use a lot of analogies too so rachel is also saying this and she's saying to tracy maybe wanting to get rid of them is from fear and won't work but in love we just see that they are lost and confused and we ignore them get on with what we want, and they lose energy and perhaps find their way to the choice, light or entropy and darkness. They're like um, blockages in the, the, the blood, you know, blood vessels, and they need to be cleared out. And the way they get cleared out, love and acceptance is part of it, and love is also like the universal solvent, like the way that water washes everything away. Love is a tone, and it literally washes them away. It unmakes them. Um, Joel is asking about the Maricaba. Bottom one spins to the left and top to the right. I always forget which way they go. So I'm a woman and that's, I'm a female and that's why I spin this one coming out of my heart. I spin around to the left and the one that's coming out of the base of my spine, I spin around to the right. And my little shorthand for this is when I go like that. But 
for males, I hear that it is the opposite. So I'm just going to say I'm not a male. I can't report from that firsthand, but other males have told me that they feel more comfortable doing their spinning in the opposite way. So I say to everyone, hold your paintbrush of reality in the way that is comfortable to you. I will not dictate it to you, but you get to choose in the way that you do it. And infinity says, read demons. I like to treat demons the same way as one would treat as my own would be infant. Wait, say this again. I like to treat demons the same as my own would be infant with a coochie coochie coo. God, they hate that. Good. That is the way to do it. To be lighthearted, maybe even a little condescending, um, not to be afraid or intimidated by them. Um, that definitely brings them down many, many notches because they're very used to being puffed up and to being like, people will be afraid of me and I'll be empowered. Like it's very disempowering to them. And you're like, yes, I'm not afraid. Um, Brandon is saying um, that he FRLs with uh, all the water when he's in the shower with the water crystals. Like that is very profound. And so I've also been doing, oh, and I'll get to that question too, Sarah Jane, then that will be the end of the broadcast. I also FRL with tiny microbes, the microbial realm. And this is really powerful because the microbes are everywhere. They're all pervasive. They're not only in our mouth and throat and stomach and you know covering the surface of your body, they're in the air. We're surrounded by microbes. They're surrounding all of their, uh, coating the substances, they're coating all the surfaces. The microbes that are in this room fly through the air and fly to my neighbors and fly you know, across continents. There's a whole microbial realm that is interconnected and intercommunicative. So if you fly in your lasagna with your own microbiome and with the microbes in your direct world, you're literally connecting with the entire microbial realm. And that is billions, so so countless, I can't even do the calculation. If I have at least 5 trillion gut bacteria and I'm just one individual person, how many billions of individual people are on this planet times 5 trillion? And that's just the ones that are in your gut. That's not even including the ones that are like up your nose or on your eyelashes or, you know, whatever. So yes, um, the microbial realm is another profound way to connect. And then there's the molecular realm, the realm of just atoms and molecules. You can connect with an oxygen atom and FRL with it. And then it can carry that music to all of the other oxygen molecules as it is oxygenating or burning things. Like it gets to be very profound. And I do that with my FRL practice each day and in some ways it's easier than connecting with macroscopic human intellects because of the ego human intellects often have this barrier where they're like when i'm like knock 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 want to want to connect want to play they're like who are you i'm skeptical blah blah blah, go away i'm like okay that's cool dancing away but when i go up to a tree or to a microbe they're much more like let's dance because they're ready and they want to connect in that way so i find that sometimes if i'm blocked on being able to get energy to a certain place because of human intellect slash ego not wanting it to go there then i can be like wait let's just connect on a cellular level let's connect on the level of uh, microbes and you know the molecules and that that's a, it's a way of um superseding any limitations that are at the macroscopic ego level so this is a really great question from sarah jane she says can demons be healed the answer is yes big yes we are in the planetary expression of what it is to heal demons and the whole idea is healing does not mean hugging like if you're a methamphetamine addict and I want to heal you, I'm not going to be like, let me hug you, come into my house and, you know, take all of my uh, electronics and sell them at a pawn shop for, you know, for drugs. Like, no, that's not what healing is. Healing would be saying, what is the origin of your discomfort and how can we transcend or transform your discomfort? That's what it is. So the real answer is how can we heal demons? What is the origin of their discomfort? Why don't they have bodies? Why do they want your body? Why don't they eat love? Why can't they eat love? Why do they want to eat misery? Why are they acting in this way? And this all goes back to galactic history and the backstory of beings who use technology instead of embodying into organic, living, vital, cellular structures. The answer is they made an ancient choice that was not a good choice and it screwed them up for a really long amount of time and got them into their present position. So the first thing is you don't have to pity them like, poor demons who made a bad choice a long time ago because they pity themselves a lot. They're like, we want to eat you. We have to eat you like vampires. Like, don't blame us that we have to eat your blood. It's not our fault. It's like, yeah, actually it is your fault because the truth is ever since the invention of the flying rainbow lasagna, that everybody has a choice. They actually have a choice now to run OS love, to go towards the operating system of love and not to have to eat misery instead. So any demon that's doing the whole poor me, pity me, it's not my fault, 
is like pulling, they're yanking your chain, they're pulling your legs. So the other thing is the demons that originally left the source, not only bridge of love, had a different value system than the present demons that are eating off of your love and degrading it into a lower level substance. They were meant to run on entropy. The entropy would be like deciding, I'm going to jump off a building and I'm going to fall towards the ground. Falling towards the ground is entropy. It's loss of energy. Like falling towards the ground is loss of height. So those beings that left the source, they were supposed to go into entropy, falling backwards, 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 backwards in time, backwards away from awareness, away from intelligence, away from consciousness. And at a certain point, they got degraded and they said, wait, wait, we're not going to go into entropy anymore. We're going to go towards energy. We're going to get your energy. And that's how we're going to go towards energy. And this is a total subversion of like what would be considered their original religion or their original program. Like their religion, in their original religion, being a good person means going to entropy. But then at a certain point, they got changed, just like Christianity got distorted. And now in their religion, being a good person means sucking like a vampire off of you and me. Like, good job. You really sucked off of those humans. A lot of misery today. Good job. I pat you on the back like I'm a demon supervisor. They all have supervisors. It's like a hierarchy. It's like the ultimate pyramid scheme. And it's where we got our economy from. And it's where we got pyramid schemes from. So yeah, there's low level demons that are like the new initiates. They just got hired. And there's the, the bosses at the top. And the lower ones work for the ones that are at the top. It's like, how many humans did you torture today? Did you, uh, how, how many ounces of misery did you wring out of them for me today? And then you got to kick back to the top. The lower level demons always would be like, okay, I earned 10 units of energy today. You get to keep one and nine units of energy go to the hungry managers at the top because the managers always get paid more than the lower level workers. Like this is the, the our entire world is a reflection of that invaders, the you know consciousness invaders, value system and everything like that. So how do we heal a demon or how do we heal the entire demonic structure by sending those demons into entropy? So I no longer have extensive conversations with demons or intrusive thoughts that want to come inside of my body or, or live through my mind or whatever. I simply say to them, you are intended to go to entropy and then I take their energy away from them. And how do I, you could say, Aurora, how do you do that? Like how do you take energy away from something? So you can envision like a cosmic vacuum cleaner, like. Uh, like I'm taking that energy away from you and I'm going to store it up in a big energy storing, you know, thing and I'm going to send it where it's supposed to go or that it instantaneously gets flying rainbow lasagna vibrated to where it's supposed to be because all the energy that they have is stolen energy. All of it. It's like if you did an audit on the, the bookkeeping of the mob, of the mafia, you're like, that, that you didn't earn this money. This money isn't yours. This money isn't yours. This came from stealing. This came from raping. This came from prostitution. None of this money is yours. If you actually healed it, you would send all of that money back to the people that they stole it from. Repatriation. That, re, Patricia says, return to rightful owner. That's exactly right. All of their energy has been taken like vampires from living people. And it was taken through rape. Like literally horrible rape and torture and murder. And... Um, the beings that they took it from really want it back. And so what you can do is you can use flying rainbow lasagna as like a form of cosmic justice where you are saying, oh, I just audited your books. Nothing that you own is actually yours and you are intended to return all of this instantaneously to its original owners that you stole it from. And this is the real truth. Like I said, again, when you start to activate your insight and your inner eye, I love what Rachel is saying, return to sender, we are just cleaning up. Um, you can read everybody like a book. That means everything you've ever done is written on the pages of you. Patricia is saying we take our power back. That is exactly right. And especially in your own body. Like if anybody has raped, tortured, tormented, harmed you in any way, they took energy from you, go to them and get your energy back, whether they're alive or dead or demonic or embodied. That's your energy. So that's a big part of personal healing. When you heal a demon, you take away all the energy that they've stolen and you return them to entropy, which is coldness, non-moving, no molecular movement, no intellectual capacity, no thinking, no, no awareness. And you also either reabsorb that energy into yourself or you send it back to the original um, victim or experiencer, because I don't want it to be victim like a passive you know, a victim. And this person was just saying, shamanic, what did you just say? That was really good. I'm reading these comments as they're going on. Patricia said, first we take our power back and then calling back your spirit, very shamanic. That's the idea. That's what those true shamanic practices are cosmic justice, that taking the energy that was stolen from, from people, returning it to them and the beings who stole 
they're not even supposed to be in the time field. They're distortions in the glass. It's supposed to be perfectly clear glass and they're like pebble glass that make everything look distorted and weird. Or like if you've ever seen um, an animation of a gravitational lens, like what a black hole looks like, it looks like something that kind of makes all the pictures behind it warble instead of like be a perfectly clear um, um, line of sight that we're looking at. So, um, and there were so there are many many things that I wanted to say that I didn't get a chance in all of this recording, but I hope that all of the the main points came through, and I hope that I spoke very clearly about this. So once again, within each one of us, there is a combination of cosmic personality characteristics, some of which are divine and which are part of the musical score that are supposed to be there, some of which are not divine, and it's up to each one of us to determine. Hey, what are the right notes? What am I supposed to actually be playing? What am I not supposed to actually be playing? Who's the real me? Who's not the real me? And to kick out the invaders and not to feed them, like not to continue continue to feed the sense of um, um, guilt or unworthiness or violence or addiction. Like many people are like, oh, gr grandpa and granddad were, uh, and grandpa and father were both alcoholics, so I'm alcoholic too. Like there's so many justifications and excuses. Like, no, you don't have to continue those behavior patterns um, simply because they came to you from your family, from your religion. There's a lot of things in the Jewish religion that I do not espouse or agree with. And there's a lot of things, we're getting, we're getting kisses over here, a lot of things in the Christian religion that I cannot espouse. So I don't consider myself to be part of any church like that. I told you she loves strawberry lipstick for special occasions. So with your permission, I'm going to end the recording for right now, unless there are any more comments. Thank you. And that way I can take dog boss for a walk, okay? Uh, mm, 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 thank you. Mm, thank you, everyone, for understanding. Ah, exactly. Cheeky was very patient this whole two hours, sitting on my lap, being quiet, being really good. Mm, she definitely deserves some, some boss praise. Very good boss praise. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you very much. Let me end the recording for right now, and then we'll continue saying, saying how much we love each other. Thank you for everyone who